everyone. Buenas noches a todos y todas. Eh, mi nombre es Yuri Toku, soy la direct subdirectora de la Oficina de Estudios Latinos y Latinoamericanos, OYA, aquí en la Universidad de Nebraska, en Omaha. Eh, my name is Yuri Toku, I'm the Assistant Director of the UNOF Office of Latino and Latin American Studies. Uh, on behalf of OYA, I would like to welcome you all to our third uh, artist talk tonight uh, with Yarisa Colon Torres. So Yarisa is a poet and handmade book creator. She was born in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico. She earned a bachelor's degree in Black and Puerto Rican Studies and Psychology from Hunter College, CUNY, and a master's degree in Puerto Rican Literature from the Center for the Advanced Studies on Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. So please welcome Yarisa. Hola, hi everyone. I'm going to open up the PowerPoint and begin the presentation. I'm really, really honored to be here with you all. Thank you for your presence. Came in today from New York, so it feels, feels like time traveling. Do you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Mi nombre es Yarisa. My name is Yarisa, and I would like to thank um, the committee of Ollas for inviting me to share my work and speak about the things that I love the most, which is poetry and the craft of bookmaking. Um, thank you very much, Yuriko, for the guidance and for welcoming with such um, warmth. And thank you, Iria because um, through my relationship with her as a mentor three years ago, while she was doing her master's, um, I was able to establish this connection. And it's been 12 years since we met online and we've worked together online and today we meet in person. So thank you very much. Um, so I was, I was born in Puerto Rico and I moved to New York City when I was 14. And I currently teach Spanish at Bronx Community College. And I also have been publishing my poetry for over 15 years, creating handmade books. Um, I wanted to share two photos that are very dear to me. One on the left is the view of my grandmother's town. Lares, there's a mountainous area in Puerto Rico, and on the right is the view of a street where I used to live in the Bronx, um, because these two photos reflect my comings and goings, my id y venir, my roots that are uprooted. Um, I usually feel uh, in both places at the same time, or in no place, and this idea, well, this is part of the reason why I, I find that um, creating art provides a space for me to ground myself, at least in a metaphorical way. Um, these are my parents, and I bring this up because um, due to their commitment to their political views, and their tenacity, um, I also learned a lot about my voice, or at least developing my voice, or at least trying to find a space for my voice. And basically this is the title of the exhibit, right? Latinx, um, the voices of our roots, o la voz de nuestras raíces. And I want to emphasize that the best way for me to share what I feel, what I, um, how I envision the world is through, through writing and the creation of books. This circular book is inspired by my parents' political commitment during the 80s. And in it, it incorporates collages and written text related to the, the very harsh and complex surveillance system that was instituted and um, in place in the island during that time. And 
I, uh, my parents were, were activists, so this is, this attempts to recollect some of the memories that I have of that time. If, if you were to open the pages, you would see photos of my family, photos of the island, and also a lot of childish images. It's a way of, you know, it's a way of going back in time, at least that's how I see it. It's a way of recreating this period um, in the 80s. It's very nostalgic and it's all, it almost seems like an invention. It almost seems like I imagined that era, which was very complicated. Even at that time in the 80s, the Puerto Rican flag was um, seen to be a subversive um, symbol. And in our parents' house, we had those symbols on the second floor, so nobody could see them. Political symbols were basically on the second floor just to protect ourselves. So in a way, the fact that all these all the information is inside the book and you have to peek. It's, it's a way for me to perhaps symbolize that surveillance and that gaze. Um, in addition to, to my family, which is a topic that I am always interested in exploring through my writing or creative work, I have worked for many, many years with different um, artists in New York City and in Puerto Rico and most of them are very dear friends and guides and mentors. I began to work with Tania Torres, the person in the middle. Um, this was back in 2001 at a very small gallery in East Harlem. It was um, on the first floor of her, of her brownstone um, building. And it was Tania Torres that introduced me to the world of bookmaking. Um, she invited five poets to publish our works. And ever since then, I've decided to use this method to publish my work. Um, the two books that were edited by Tania Torres and published under the name of Mixta Gallery are Desvestida, on the left is in English is undressed and on the right which is a very tiny book is called pipas or bellies that's the pipa is the word for where a woman is pregnant for the most part um, we did 50 books in Spanish and we translated the work into English and created 50 other um, books These were, these were the first books that, um, that um, I made under the guidance of Tania Torres. After that, um, I moved to France for a while and then I went back to Puerto Rico, not thinking that I would live in Puerto Rico ever again after being in New York for so many years, but um, such is life. And I went back in 2003 and collaborated with couple of different artists. The first one is um, Waleska Rivera. You see her face in the Polaroid pictures. And we created 25 books. They are boxes designed by us and they are made out of cardboard. Um, there's a local fast food restaurant and we pick them up, we clean them as much as we could and um, that's what we use. I should mention that, uh, that I'm always using, most of the times, I'm using discarded material, found material, or material that could be easily um, acquired or that is free. Um, so in this, this box is called Caja de Voces, a box with voices, and it incorporates a series of poems inspired by her uh, portraits. She took photos of herself and she distorted them. This is a photo of another poetry book that incorporates a series of poems based on conversations with another fellow artist from Puerto Rico. Her name is Yolanda Velasquez. The monotype, the bookmark, the yellow bookmark that you see on top, it's, it includes a monotype by her. She's a printmaker. 
as well. And in this case, um, I think I have been mentioned, the title of the book is Entre Línea o Secuestro. <laughs> it's the underlining, um, it's the, co the content that is underneath the text, the Entre Línea. And then Secuestro is an abduction. Um, so in this case, I was dealing with um, the fact that I did not know exactly where, where my voice was. Has it been abducted? Because I did not know exactly how to speak, even though I speak Spanish, I did not know how to speak to my fellow, <laughs> to my friends in Puerto Rico after being outside for over 10 years, over let's say to almost 20 years. So I, I was completely mi misplaced. So this poet, poetry book um, deals about that issue. And it was translated into French by a colleague of, of mine that lives in Paris, she's a translator. And we created an exhibit. Unfortunately, the photos are very, very small, but in the back of those are photos of my hands, I basically modeled for her. And it was part of a collaborative work. Um, this was presented, both books were done in 2010. Caja de Voces, The Box, and also this blue book. I, I did 25 copies. So I do them at home, I cut the board, I design the pages, the content, and I print everything, and I bind them. Um, so here we have two different editions of a third poetry book that I created in Puerto Rico. Um, it's called Sin Cabeza, Without a Head. And it includes poems that I wrote during a 10 year period in, in New York, in France, and in Puerto Rico. And it also speaks to my travelings, to my sense of not belonging or belonging. And it also speaks to the invention the, the way I invent my own life through the act of writing my fictionalized autobiography, perhaps. Um, the book on the left, it's, it was edited, this was the first edition, the one, the red one, by a move, by an independent press called Atarraya Cartonera. And the Cartoneras, maybe you have heard of this movement, which began in Argentina in 2001. It's a independent literary movement. Uh, I will say it in a short version, but please, please Google it if you're very interested in Cartoneras because it is an amazing movement to democratize literature. It began in Argentina and has spread all over the world. And in Argentina, at least, they began to buy cardboard from the cartoneros, from the people that were making um, their livelihood, um, selling cardboard and creating um, such books. So it is an uh, inspiration for me. Um, and then I decided to revise this poetry book and create the one that you see on, on top, which I painted the, the envelopes, created monotypes, and I collaborated with a Dominican artist that was living in Puerto Rico at the time, and he created the illustrations. These are some of the illustrations. Everything good so far? Questions? <laughs> You're there? Okay. So I, I also create books for other poets, um, and this one, which you will see here later. Okay. It's called Sibeles Que Sueña, Sibeles As She Dreams, and it was, it's a poetry book um, written by Lourdes Vasquez, and it's translated into English by Enriqueta Carrington. Um, we decided to create 35 of these. So I, I also used cardboard and I painted the outside pages and the inside pages as well. 
And then she, um, she's super inspired by the cartoneras as well. She's also a librarian emerita from Rutgers University and she's very knowledgeable about the history of bookmaking in Latin America. So she wanted to create an edition of her nonfiction text called The Tango Files using that cover. It's cardboard, made out of cardboard. My third collaboration with her is a series of collages. This collaboration is called Four, Cuatro, and I chose four poems um, from this publication by Lourdes Vasquez and created um, this collage. For example, it's called Orishas. This, co this is called Yo Creo, Creo, I believe. Te concebimos, we conceived you, and I incorporated her poem both in English and Spanish in this one. And this one is called The Possible. Um, for the last part of my presentation, I would like to share some photos of books that have moved away from the traditional or, or conventional, well, this, this is pretty, <laughs> this is not that conventional, but the books that you will see are, are further away from what some people may view as books. Um, this one, for example, it's called CISO, an offering to Julia de Burgos, a Puerto Rican poet who also lived in New York City for many years. And here, um, this was exhibited in a collective show dedicated to, to conveying that language is a part of our identity. And um, since Julia de Burgos found herself feeling very delightful learning English, even as a Puerto Rican, which is sometimes a, a, a source of contention, like for example, some people may um, question our identity based on the fact that we may or may not know Spanish and, and that's a very complicated issue for us. So I decided to pinpoint that Julia de Burgos, who was a fierce nationalist freedom fighter, was super happy to learn English and she did not feel this contradiction, she just embraced both languages. And her poetry is, is filled with imagery about the river and the ocean. And I decided to work with the colors of Oshun, which is the river, talking about the Orishas, right, in Santeria, and the blue colors of Jemaya, the goddess of the sea and the goddess of the river. This series is, is titled Dead Alive. And uh, they are a lot of discarded material from, from my house, my work, um, pages that I used to write my poetry in, and then I decided not to throw away, but create this particular books, and I burned um, all the pages and bind the, these pages. The, the trio on the right is called Basic Knowledge, Dignity, Justice, and Peace. This one is titled Paranoia, and it's a chain book. It was like reading a lot about the in, and old antique uh, libraries, exclusive libraries in certain European countries where the books are changed, or still are, um, and I, I was attracted to that image. And this one is called Vertebrae. So as you can tell, I, I, I'm not using words anymore. I, I still create poetry books. I'm, I'm actually now working on a poetry book that will come out in, in May, and I'm working with a painter to create an accordion book with my latest poetry, but I also work with texture and colors and threads and other materials to convey what, what I need to convey. It's a, an accordion book um, 
that includes a poem called Heart in Flames. And the paper that, it's, that I use for, for the outside is made by Aida Sara Ortega, a colleague friend uh, living in New York City. She creates paper, mostly using tea bags and other materials. I also use cardboard and, and I covered it which is, and then this one is called Creeper and Fan in Real Colmillo, and it was exhibited in 2010 as part of a collective show in Puerto Rico um, that we organized to talk and denounce the issue of uh, gender against women in the island. And I decided to continue to work with, with this book. Uh, it includes one long poem. And I created this big piece, this installation, um, nine years later. And I revised the poem and I created this chapbook, which I, yeah, it's, it's like a very, very simple way of just sharing the work. Um, Finally, this is the book that, that you could see live at the Museo Latino, the, the big one, right? Um, not the accordion book. It's called um, Libro de Recetas, recipe book. And it's in, uh, yeah. So um, thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you very much for the time. I also brought, um, well, first off, if we, we could, I think we have some time for questions or comments. I would love to hear your thoughts or questions. And also, um, I brought some books that you can you can see. Thank you. Thank you very much. I find it more difficult to write. I find myself struggling more, revising more. I'm very judgmental when I write, whereas when I'm creating a book, I feel a sense of freedom that I do not feel when I'm writing. So I would say if like if I were to choose, perhaps it's like creating the books. And it's very manual and um, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you feel is the driving inspiration for your work? Like, is it your personal, like the way you were raised and the way you live today? Or is it like the political background here or in Puerto Rico? Like, what is it that? Mm -hmm. I would say it, it's, it's all of it, mm -hmm. but it, it just, it comes out at different times. Um, it, it coincides, I, I, I could be, let's say, um, <laughs> thinking about a uh, current issue and, and, and two minutes later thinking about my childhood, I, I, I imagine this is not just me. This is, this is the, I don't, I'm not sure. But this is how I tend to think. I, I jump back from times and I tend then to create something that in a way orders, gives some sense to that chaos, right? And so I would say that it, that is all of it, but also um, I find myself um, working with, um, with particular themes for a period of time, let's say for a year or two or three, and then life moves me into another theme because of particular situations and all the, like the, yeah, the, Whatever my, my experience is, what I'm reading, or who, whoever I'm getting to know, etc. Yes? Uh, when you're writing your poetry, does it like remind you anyone that comes to mind, or is it after you've written your poetry that you're like, okay, I can finally make those comments and find my book or such? Mm -hmm. um, it varies. It varies. If, I'm, if I am working with, with a series of poems, and um, usually I, 
it, 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 so for example, um, when I was working, it, it varies according to the project, to the, to the content, to the purpose of the book, right? To even the theme. But when I was working with Juarezca Rivera, um, while we were having dialogues about the, the concept of the book, we decided that um, the, the pages would be loose, they would not be binded, so that it would be contained in this box. These are voices, or at least representations of some of my voices, and they would be, uh, they could be the, uh, unshuffled or reshuffled, or a person could just take one page and, and never put it back. And it's just like that sense of, of not being ordered was, was discussed. And then we decided, okay, so it would be a box and it would not be sewn. Yeah. Sometimes um, if I am working on, a, on, a, of, on many poems, for example, right now I'm working on a book that includes 30 poems. I am giving more emphasis on the poetry right now. And then I will think about the, the form but sometimes it's the other way around. Can I have a few more questions? Sorry. So how does it differ when you're like in Puerto Rico versus New York? Like what countries do you see in your writing or in your creating? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I ha I've had to, um, uh, how can I say this? Just, just be, be, perhaps sometimes okay with the fact that that is completely this these are completely different spaces that are obviously influenced by each other because um, thousands of Puerto Ricans moved to New York City in the 40s and even in the 19th century there was a big migration or maybe not so big but they were freedom fighters living in New York City so so the history is there but the culture is very different the way people interact on a daily basis is also very different. I should also mention that, that I speak Spanish, that I think in Spanish, even though I arrived in New York City when I was 14. And that is also, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, a problem anymore, it's just my way of being, <laughs> but yeah. So um, I, I find that in Puerto Rico, there are a lot of artists that are Due to the the political climate that are super direct and and just um that and i and i'm and I, what i mean by like they're expressing their sentiment their feelings their needs um in a very coherent way and very honest way and and that inspires me a lot yes Um, challenges, um, challenges. <laughs> well, I would say that, that one of the main challenges for me, and I guess for my family, is that we, we have to work, obviously, and pay our rent, and, 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 like, that cannot be denied, right? Um, issues of class. So, that is that has been a challenge but i have been able to in a way work around it even with the materials that i use and the and also the 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 ways that i work with others i'm talking about artists and, and mentors so that those are two examples i guess yeah Collaboration in its absolute best. It, it, it's always a challenge, and, and that's all, also okay. Um, I, I recently worked with a performance artist, Marielis Burgos, in, in New York, and I learned a lot from her way of communicating um, her, her ideas, her needs for the, for the actual um, performance to happen. 
And I learned through her that, that there's like a lot of space to, before doing the work, to, to communicate what we both need. And it's not like necessarily about reaching a consensus, but it's about acknowledging our needs and our, our ways of seeing the work, which I, I found it very enriching. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yes. Yes. So um, I, I have been deeply, deeply inspired by the Cartolera movement, the cardboard literary press. There's also a, a literary project in Cuba. It's, it's, been, it's been running since 1985. It's called Ediciones Vidia. And they also use um, whatever material is accessible from like pa white paper, right? Like um, just, just the material that is there. Um, and I'm also super inspired by the chapbooks that were made by the New Yorican poets, just, just printing and even the zines, the fanzines, um, that, that way of creating art attracts me because um, for, oh, for aesthetic reasons, I, I, I truly find it interesting, but I also find that it's a political statement. Um, and I have been able to create objects that that I that at least I find that are worth being for a while. They they could they could definitely deteriorate, and that's part of the nature of the um, of the material, right? But in the in the world of bookmaking. The, the, I, I acknowledge and I admire the work of artists that create books with very detailed, uh, like with high quality materials, archival um, glue and all of that. And I tend to do that, for example, if it's a very particular book. But the intention for my books are not necessarily to be in an archive or in an it's like it's, it's, that's not my intention necessarily. It's more like in I I have shown my work in, in fairs, like craft fairs. Like I I really have no issue with that, especially in Puerto Rico where you see artists that are highly trained that for 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 limited uh, resources or or because institutions are not necessarily open to their work have to exhibit their work in the street. So, so that that um, that transit I enjoy, and and then it's up to the viewer to to receive it or not, to criticize it. I, like I um, I welcome it as well. I understand. <laughs> I try. Yes. So you. How long did it take you to do that last piece, the one that you're about to reveal? And, and how do you work? Do you work on a piece like that? every day or when you're inspired to work on it or just that process so the, um i i was working on this piece and and several other pieces for an exhibit that i had in puerto rico um i would say for two years right after after teaching after working at, in the bronx i would go home and, and spend some time so during weekends i dedicate my saturday sunday <laughs> so it's it depends on the on the on the book on the complexity of the book. Yeah. Yes. I want to ask you um, because I know you started as a poet, and so as a writer uh, who's accustomed to having the content on the pages of a book that people can open, um, do you feel any? Uh, have you had any kind of conflict? In your mind, because you know this this is a lovely piece that's down at the um, at the El Museo Latino um, about whether people understand what's printed on the inside. That initial work you showed us, I think I would think that most people want to sort of pry it apart and look in there. Um, how do you how do you make peace with that? Um, uh, the fact the audience probably wants to do that, but you may even want to. And a lot of authors would be like, ah, oh, you've got to be able to. 
In the case of the circular book, I I um, told the person that 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 owns it now that that he he could definitely peek into it. It's it's not as fragile as it seems, um, but I I do understand our resist perhaps somebody's resistance to, to touching it so much. Um, and, and those are considerations that I always have to, to, to keep in mind. And, and sometimes I would say it, I'm not fully satisfied. And then I would have to try again and again and again because, because the relationship between like the form and, and the written content and, and even the texture is, it, is very complex it, for me in, in and of itself. So it, it's, it's a constant um, learning and exper experience or constant experimentation. For, for this one, um, for this one, which, which is, is, this one is, is big, it's almost six feet long. Um, unfortunately, this this photograph is, is not does not give you the sense of the size of it. But at least in this case, I was I felt like I was able to work with that issue because the book could be open fully and obviously it, it's not a book that you can turn pages. It's an accordion book that must be placed on a surface, and then the person would have to come close to. And then on one side is in English, the poem, and on the other side is, is the translation in Spanish. So at least in this case, I felt that I was able to, to, to work with that, with that, with those issues. I, I feel like like asking you what do you what do you think it represents, but you could tell me later uh, because I'm sure that it represents something different for for different people. For me, um, burning burning a page, burning paper, uh, it's I associate fire with resistance. I must say, I, I I find that that's like obviously all the elements are have a very strong quality to them. And uh, in this case, fire, at least in my case, it, it, it represents that impulse to want to transform things in an immediate way, which is not necessarily always the case, but at least, at least that is for me right now, the interpretation that I give it. Although when it comes to the symbol of, of books that, which are burned, I, I, I also think of censorship um, and, and um, I, I cannot elude that, that um, idea. For example, in the, with the burn books, um, it's like a, a, a very, at least, at least that's how I feel, like it's a very fierce quality, but at the same time I, I was, they're called dead alive and I, and it, some may have said, oh, it, it may have to do with transformation and rebirth as well, but um, it could also be censorship, self-censorship as well. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Okay, so um, if, if, if you want, there's some books here that um, you can take a look. And thank you once again for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.
And the workshop, and the workshop tomorrow, tomorrow with Teresa. Yes, sorry. Where's that? It's at the uh, Studio. And it's at 10 a.m. Yeah. We will be creating a, an accordion book. Um, the size of, of this one. I mean, it's, it depends on the amount of pages that you want to include. 